Hello everyone and uh, welcome to Canberra. My name is Bryce Wakefield and I am the National Executive Director of the Australian Institute of International Affairs. Well, uh, Suga Yoshihide has been selected the, uh, the, the, the leader, the president of the Liberal Democratic Party of Japan, which means that soon the Diet will approve him as Japan's new Prime Minister. Suga is the son of a strawberry farmer. He uh, worked in um, a cardboard factory after he moved to Tokyo. Um, and he has an altogether different background from his predecessor, uh, the long-serving Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. How long, uh, what, what will be, the, uh, what will be the, the, the legacies of the um, Abe premiership? Um, we will talk about that with our guest, uh, Tobias Harris. Hi, Tobias. How are you? Hi, Bryce. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm, uh, it's bright and early here in Washington, but it's really a pleasure to join you to talk about this. Great. And yeah, we, we really appreciate you getting up at uh, 3.30 or 4 o'clock to, to join us today. So for those of you who don't know, Tobias, um, Tobias uh, was uh, back in the day when I was a PhD student which was appointment reading for those of us who uh, who were studying Japanese politics. I think it was 2006, 2007, wasn't it? Tobias? That was when I started, yeah. 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 Um, since then, he has become the vice president of uh, Tenio, which is a political uh, risk consultancy firm uh, where um, he obviously focuses on Japan. He has um, a... Uh, an MPhil from uh, Cambridge University and um, and has done graduate research at MIT. So to take us, he is also the author of uh, The Iconoclast, which is the uh, newly published uh, new, new, newly published biography of uh, the former Prime Minister, or current Prime Minister actually still, uh, Shinzo Abe, soon to be former. Um, and it's a fantastic read. I read it on the weekend. Um, it's, it's incredibly clear, incredibly lucid, um, and it gives a very balanced portrait of Japan's Prime Minister. So with that, I will turn things over to Tobias. You have the floor. Thank you again, Bryce. Um, so I'm going to talk, of course, about what we might expect from Suga, but I also want to discuss before we, we get uh, into uh, the incoming Prime Minister and talk about what we can learn from Abe's uh, record setting tenure uh, as prime minister and what that might tell us about what's to come uh, from a Suga government. So back in 2012, uh, I was in Japan at the University of Tokyo doing some research um, and it was June of 2012 and got an invitation to see uh, a talk by former prime minister Shinzo Abe and I thought, well, you know, I, I remembered blogging about his, his year as uh, prime minister and had just sort of felt nostalgic for that and thought, well, okay, I'll, I'll go see. It was, you know, weekend afternoon. Um, wasn't really expecting much of it, but just thought it would be uh, for old time's sake to see him speak. And um, it was hot. The room was not air conditioned. This was, you know, just over a year after uh, Japan's triple disaster, so there was lots of uh, energy saving, and I, I barely remember what he said. And little did I know that day that uh, not even three months after that, he would once again be the leader of the LDP, because at that point, uh, I don't think anyone really expected that, uh, that by the end of the year, he would become prime minister, or that almost eight years later, he would finally be leaving office after setting longevity records, you know, becoming Japan's not just longest serving uh, a number of days when you count uh, his total time as prime minister with his first premiership, but also the longest con consecutive tenure, uh, which he broke uh, a few days before he announced his intention to resign, uh, surpassing a great uncle. So, I mean, it's, it's been a remarkable run. I don't think uh, even after he was uh, reelected as prime minister in, in December of 2012, I don't think anyone expected that we'd still be talking about his long tenure eight years later. Um, it's, it's really, it's, it's an extraordinary achievement in itself. And we shouldn't uh, downplay the importance of that kind of stability. And, and I realize this could be a sensitive subject in Australia, but um, not too long ago, Japan, of course, had uh, gone through six prime ministers in as many years, starting with Abe in 2006. And, you know, and I think Japan has always had uh, 
maybe something of an inferiority complex about its democracy. That the, you know, the phrase during the Cold War was that Japan has a first rate, a first rate economy and third rate politics. And so I think there's always been a sense of, uh, you know, Japan is not being terribly well governed, you know, that it had a great economy and maybe a great bureaucracy to run it, but the politicians who were in charge um, were never actually in charge, were never all that capable. Um, maybe they were corrupt, maybe they weren't competent, maybe they were more interested in infighting. And, and I think this, you know, this kind of sense uh, was, has always lurked in Japanese politics. And I think it drove a number of reformers to want to change things, particularly after the Cold War ended and, and to make uh, a more vibrant two-party system, uh, stronger uh, prime minister-led governments. And, and, and this, was, this was several decades of, um, you know, of pressure for reform in part because of this inf inferiority complex. Um, but, you know, I think now after eight years of Abe in power, I mean, I think, uh, you know, we, we can say that Japan's political system has, has changed in some ways. And, and towards the end, you know, I will get more into uh, what we can expect um, from Suka to continue. Um, the thing that when it, when it comes to Abe's record setting tenure, I mean, I think there's always the question of is, you know, was he lucky or was he good? I mean, I think it's the question always to ask about any politician. You know, how much how much of their success is uh, just being in the right place at the right time or how much was actually through skill? I mean, and, and given a tenure as long, I mean, given you know, almost eight years in office, I mean, it's, it's going to be a mix inevitably that there were some things that I think Abe happened to be in the right place in the right time for, but I think he did a lot to help himself. In the former category, in the ways in which he was lucky, I mean, I think, first of all, you know, it, it helped that until, you know, basically the end of his tenure, for, you know, for most of his tenure, the, glo the global economy was in good shape. There was a lot of demand abroad. There wasn't really a, um, you, know, you didn't have a, a global, uh, global headwinds when it came to, Japan, to, um, uh, to demand. So that you know, Japan, Abe could take power, uh, introduce his Abenomics program, which uh, drove down the value of the yen. No one seemed that concerned about that. Japanese exporters could count on uh, pretty robust demand abroad. Uh, the you know, stock market was rising as a result, record profits among Japan's corporations. I mean, all of that, I think, just made things easier. It was a permissive con condition for Abe to govern. I think there were also some domestic political factors. First of all, and, and I think this is actually especially important, uh, and I argued this in a, in a piece for um, East Asia Forum last year in 2019, that basically Japan, uh, there's a discussion that suggests, well, why has Japan avoided you know, the global populist moment? And the reality is Japan did not avoid the global populist moment. It was actually, I think, ahead of the rest of the world in the, in the global populist moment. It's just that its populism looked different. But in the 90s and 2000s, sort of in the aftermath of you know, Japan's financial crisis and, econo and economic stand stagnation, you did actually see the emergence of a kind of populism that was generally aimed at, bu at bureaucrats. It was aimed at the old LD the LDP's old guard, at, you know, as corrupt and um, basically taking public money and putting it to private ends. And you did see efforts to you know, throw the bums out, which, I mean, if populism is anything, I mean, I think it means that, aimed at um, entrenched elites who are uh, abusing power and, and not governing on behalf of all of the people. And so you did, you did see that. And during the 2000s, you, I mean, Koizumi, uh, yeah, I mean, it was a different sort of populism that was aimed at uh, kind of liberalizing Japan's economy, but it really was a populism uh, of a sort. And so he, you know, he governed for five years, waged war on his own party, what, you know, what he called the resistance forces within his own party. Uh, and you saw, you know, big waves of turnout, massive swings, you know, the LDP winning a huge majority in 2005. And then uh, the Democratic Party of Japan comes in 2009 with a huge uh, majority, also using these populist tools, you know, raging about the bureaucrats, talking about, you know, you know, you know throwing out the LDP and, and how the LDP uh, had misgoverned Japan. And I think by 2012, I think the Japanese public was exhausted by this form of politics, you know, and I, th I think, you know, exhausted by the regular change in prime ministers and exhausted by um, governments that promised a lot and ultimately did not deliver or what they did deliver was disappointing. I mean, I think uh, the Koizumi years were disappointing in many ways um, and people didn't necessarily like the changes that were wrought during the Koizumi years. And so I think, you know, Abe comes back in 2012, um, you know, the LDP has been in opposition for, for a few years. Um, and, you know, I, I think the public is willing to be uh, tolerant, um, you know, and I think they were appreciative of a government that made clear what it wanted to do 
uh, followed through on it, but also was not interested in stoking um, conflict in major ways. That I mean, with some exceptions, and there, and there were you know plenty of protests during the Abe years, and there were some issues, you know, that were hot button issues. But I think for the most part, I think Abe understood that there was a limit to how far we could push on certain issues. Like for example, for all he talked about the Constitution, I think he realized that if he pushed too hard on that, um, the the consensus around his stable government would would collapse and he did not push he did not push too hard and was willing to actually lean back and sort of let things take their course which meant not actually getting it done during his tenure uh, and and so i think he you know he did benefit from this exhaustion um, you look at his six electoral victories as prime minister or, or starting from when he became prime minister in 2012 and he basically became prime minister thanks in part to voter apathy that in basically every election you had near record low or near record low turnout and it was as much because people didn't want to show up and he was able to get his supporters out that he was able to stay in power and to keep winning election after election like the voters were just tired after what uh, the previous decade had brought for japan related to that the LDP throughout its history has been incredibly divided by factions, uh, by different uh, what were called policy tribes, uh, you know, ideo ideology, personality, and these uh, tensions, I think, have all, has, they've always made the LDP hard to govern. I mean, you look at Koizumi, the last long-serving LDP prime minister, he spent his entire tenure fighting with his own party, you know, culminating in 2005, this election where he kicks out members of his own party. Um, and, you know, runs candidates against, you know, these, these exiles from the LDP. And by 2012, you know, so the LDP loses in 2009, uh, you know, for the first time really loses um, control of, of the party. It had lost power in 1993, but uh, it was, at that point, it had been the still the largest party. In 2009, it has swept from power, uh, sharply reduced the number of seats it has in the diet. And in 2012, it is so desperate to get back in. And you get a party that is much more uh, willing to follow its leader. I think institutionally, um, you had a stronger leader than ever before, uh, you know, a leader who was able to control the distribution of party money better, was able to control the selection of the party's candidates better. And so 2012, you get a, a party that institutionally is more united. Uh, in 2009, you had lost uh, a lot of moderates from the party. So you also have a party that's more right wing, that's more beholden uh, to Abe, people who are elected for the first time in 2012 and know whose coattails they rode into power. And that made the, uh, for a much more uh, compliant, pliable, LDP than past leaders had enjoyed. And so again, you have this permission, permissive condition that not entirely due to Abe because, you know, the party just remembered what it was like to lose in 2009 and they were willing to follow the leader. So some ways though, in which I think, you know, Abe was good and was able to, to actually capitalize on these uh, circumstances. I mean, I think, you know, the benefits that Abe gained from having experienced as prime minister in 2006, 2007, losing it uh, and, and really a uh, for him, a dramatic and, and I think um, traumatic experience um, for him, I, I think was really instructive and he learned a lot from that. He learned, I think, the importance of uh, personnel control, uh, decisions and, and particularly the kind of per personnel who are going to surround him um, in the prime minister's office and in key posts around him in the prime minister's office, starting with the chief cabinet secretary, uh, the, the now newly elected uh, Mr. Suga, you know, that, that you had to have people who were um, capable of controlling the bureaucracy, who knew that their jobs were to serve the prime minister, their jobs were not to, to make a name for themselves. And that was one of the problems that he had in 2006, 2007, that the people around him were, were too interested in fighting each other uh, for strength within the prime minister's office rather than focused on protecting the prime minister. I think he had learned the importance of uh, making decisions clearly. So you had a change in the decision-making structure from the first days of the Abe government. Um, you know, small group, uh, including Abe and Suga, Abe's private secretaries and deep deputy chief cabinet secretaries all would come together and on the key issues facing the government, they were all on the same page. And I think with that also went a communication strategy that they didn't have in 2006, 2007. Decisions were made, the message was delivered, it was hammered home. And you know, that, I mean, it was just such a, a dramatic change and lesson learned. And I think related to that, I think he also absorbed the importance of, you have to focus on the issues that are of most uh, importance to voters, and that meant economic issues. 2006-2007, Abe uh, takes power. I, I think he would uh, he had, would admit, and I, and I think subsequently um, after he resigned had admitted that he was too young and was not really prepared to be prime minister in 2006, that he took the opportunity that, that events presented himself, because uh, you know, 
you never know if the chance will come again. And, and I think he, he faltered for that reason. But he hadn't realized in 2006 or, or just did not have a sophisticated grasp of economic policy of you know, really the, that the first task for prime minister is you know, jobs. And at the moment in 2006, there was also great concern about inequality. And he did not speak to those issues in 2006. And I think he, he in the wilderness, learns the importance of that, uh, come, you know, falls in with, uh, you know, what are, what are called the reflationists. They, you know, they, they stress to him the importance of addressing deflation, addressing growth, and he comes in, and that is a consistent approach. There's, there's a, some discussion of the extent to which it was just um, window dressing. Abe never really cared about it. It was something he would wheel out at election time. I don't think that's true. I, you know, I, I think he did sincerely come to believe um, that his emphasis on building a strong Japan would not work if the economy was not strong. And so whether he had full command of all the details of economic policy uh, is besides the point. I mean, it was a priority. It was the focus of a lot of time and attention. You know, there was constant tinkering and experimentation. And, and all of that, I think, was new and important. And I, and I think he realized that. I, you know, I think um, we, should, we also shouldn't, you know, underappreciate the importance of Suga himself. I mean, Suga is, and we're, and we're going to see, and I will talk more about what he brings to the premiership, uh, but you know, he was someone who um, had a strong grasp of not just the importance of economic issues and was constant, constantly whispering in Abe's ears, you know, not to forget that, uh, but also just had a strong grasp of the bureaucracy. And you know, any Japanese prime minister, you know, if you can't control the bureaucracy, if you can't impose your vision, the things you want done, on the elite bureaucracy, it's, you're not going to last long. And Suga uh, knew how the bureaucracy worked, knew how uh, to control it. I mean, from day one, he said he was going to control personnel matters. And uh, subsequently, they actually introduced a reform that actually, I think, has turned out to be one of the most critical uh, administrative reforms after three decades of reforms. And that is the cabinet and the prime minister now have the power to appoint the the most senior bureaucrats from in every ministry across the government. And Suga said, this is, I, I'm going to wield this power. You're going to come to me. And I think that basically bent the minds and the behavior of the top officials throughout the government towards the, you know, their political masters in the prime minister's office. And, and it made, I think, a tremendous difference. And it meant that they could use the, the institutional tools that the, part, the prime minister had accumulated over the years. Um, you know, I, I think what you saw uh, preceding Abe is that those institu institution those institutional tools existed um, between 2006 and 2012 when you had uh, you know, one uh, your prime ministers lasting about a year at a time but you had prime ministers who weren't able to use those so I don't think we can say you know that you know Abe was lucky to have those tools I think that Abe had learned how to use those tools um, and had the right people around him to use those tools and really to impose his will on the government and so what it meant you know getting this long stretch of continuity and stability from the Japanese government, it meant two things. It meant, I think you can look in foreign policy, that you had um, the ability to pursue to articulate, and you got this at the end of 2013, in national strategy, really, in a way that you hadn't had from the Japanese government uh, before. And then uh, the ability to actually follow through on that consistently, year in, year out. Uh, it meant that Abe was able to really to show up. You know, if you look at the numbers over the course of not even eight years, he took 81 foreign trips. You know, he, he was constantly meeting with other leaders, you know, developing a rapport with other leaders. You know, he was, you know, by the end, you know, was, you know, basically other than, than uh, Chancellor Merkel in Germany, basically the longest serving leader in the G7, you know, was this presence that was constantly, constantly um, active overseas. And I think Japan's voice was heard uh, in ways that really it hadn't been able uh, to be heard before. You know, the, you know, this talk about Japan passing or Japan missing, you couldn't have that conversation as long as Abe was around, um, that he was there. And it meant, you know, deepening relationships um, with uh, countries like Australia, with India, with the countries of Southeast Asia. I mean, during his first year, going to every ASEAN country, um, you know, and, and then meg regularly making trips. You're going to Europe, uh, strengthening ties with the European Union, strengthening ties with countries in the Middle East. I mean, all of this was possible because Abe could just go and kept doing it and, and following on earlier decisions and things that his government made. You know, 
So you look at, for example, at the bilateral relationship with India, uh, right up until last week when you, when you had the signing of, of an AXA with India, I mean, it's just been a steady progression of more and more agreements. Instead of you know, a new government coming in and, and starting over and looking at what had been done, um, you're know, building upon what had been done before. Uh, with the United States, I mean, I think you've just had a consistent appro approach of, you know, we're, we, you know, the United States has to be in the region, um, consistent. You had a, a tremendous um, success in relationship building between um, Abe and Obama, even though they didn't have quite a strong personal relationship, their administrations consistently, um, you know, during Obama's second year, you know, getting TPP across the finish line, except in the U.S. Congress, um, getting a strong, uh, stronger uh, guidelines for defense cooperation between the U.S. and Japan, uh, a lot of work on historical reconciliation. All of that was possible because you had one Japanese prime minister coming back to the table over and over again, um, using the power that, that had been you know, given to the prime minister to pursue this approach and to follow through on it. Um, on the economic side, so as, as I said, you get Abenomics. It's it is a consistent approach from day one. Um, you know, getting macroeconomic policy right, focusing on growth, uh, monetary policy, um, fiscal policy was more stop start. Maybe we can talk about that. But you know, the benefits of having that consistent approach meant, um, and, and this should not be downplayed. And that's why you know, talking about how much he achieved or not. You know, the fact is, is that you did have for years record low unemployment uh, and the highest jobs to applicant ratio that you've ever had. So if you were a, a, a young Japanese, the last eight years were pretty good for you. And I, and I think there's a reason why Abe's support actually ended up um, being stronger demographically among younger Japanese. And the strongest uh, support, if you, when you look at breakdowns in public opinion polls, were always among people in their 20s and their 30s. And if you were leaving school, um, there, you had your choice of jobs. And that was something, you know, when you look at what happened when Japan's economy wasn't in good shape, uh, when it wasn't growing, that you had people leaving school and, and leaving for part-time jobs and never having an opportunity to have good, steady, full-time work. I think there was still a lot of work to do to bring down the number of um, part-time or non-regular workers. But the fact is, is that, uh, you know, low unemployment means uh, just better life chances for young Japanese that will continue into the future. And, and so you can't, I mean, I, I don't think you can dismiss the value of that. Um, you know, this is sort of an, a foreign policy slash economic policy issue, but you also got, you know, Japan becoming a leader uh, in trade and pursuing trade negotiations. And, and uh, we saw this in, in 2017 when, when Japan's decision to bring back, or to stay committed to TPP really helped revive the agreement. Obviously not Japan alone, but did a lot, uh, a lot to save TPP after the U.S. pulled out. That was possible because you had a government that for years had been pursuing, uh, you know, Japan would lead on trade. Uh, that was a decision made early on. Abe continued to pursue it, and and really right up until the end. I mean, literally, uh, with a with a FTA announced with the UK last week. I mean, this you know this was a consistent approach, and the fact that you had one leader pursuing it, you know, year in year out. Um, you also had, I think, a spirit of experimentation in economic policy. That was a big part of what Abenomics represented, and and so we shouldn't downplay the importance of that. I think the downside of stability was that it meant that. Um, you had a leader who at times, I think, and, and over time, increasingly, I think, pursued stability as an end in itself. And certainly as the world looked more unstable, uh, domestic stability, domestic um, peace looked, I think, more valuable, which meant that maybe you didn't get some of the more ambitious reforms that um, you know, some people wanted in the economy and wanted Abenomics to be. Uh, you know, I think Abe had sometimes shied away from those reforms in the interest of preserving stability and preserving his government. And, and so, I mean, maybe that's a downside um, that you just didn't, you know, that strong leadership didn't necessarily mean ambitious leadership. And I think it meant Japan maybe hanging back um, on some issues where it should have led. I mean, I think climate change being the foremost example. You know, I think it meant that Abe wasn't necessarily able to convert his his leadership into foreign policy victories. You know, he wanted a settlement with Russia. I think, you know, maybe that was for reasons um, outside of his control. I, I don't think he was ever going to really get a, a satisfactory ter territorial settlement um, out of Vladimir Putin. But the point being that strong leadership did not necessarily mean that he was going to have success in all endeavors. And I think Abe admitted that in, in the press conference where he announced his intention to resign. Um, I'm at risk of going a little over long. Um, so I just want to figure, uh, uh, finish up on Suga. And so now you have the transition to um, Abe's left-hand man, right-hand man after eight years. Um, I think a lot of the, the, the conditions um, 
domestically that favored Abe's long-term government will prevail. I think there's a demand for stability by the Japanese public. I think Suga has the ability to govern. I mean, he has shown that. I think he has the ability to control the Japanese government. I and mean, there's some question whether he can find someone to play the role that he played. Um, and, and, and it's probably unlikely that he will find someone who's as good at being a chief cabinet secretary. We'll have to see in the coming days who he picks uh, for the key jobs in the government. Um, on the, the international side, I mean, I think you know, the Japanese public, given the uncertainties of the world, I think there's going to continue to be a premium on a stable government that can continue to stay in power. I don't think the Japanese people want uh, a return to a revolving door premiership. I think that will um, lend itself uh, maybe to, to public tolerance. Um, you know, I think the public was willing to forgive, for example, a number of scandals that Abe faced in the last several years of his premiership, in part because the public wanted uh, stability. You know, they were not rushing to vote Abe out. I mean, particularly because there didn't seem to be a strong enough alternative. Um, and so that I think will continue to matter. I think maybe some of the biggest question about Suga, and we can talk about this in the Q&A, is whether he can do, I mean, what in the, the US context, uh, you know, the, the vision thing, you know, whether he'll actually be able to inspire the public, whether he'll be able to offer um, a kind of direction, you know, a, a clear sign of where he wants to take Japan, which sometimes voters want to hear. Uh, perhaps working in his favor, and, and Bryce, you mentioned this in your introduction. I mean, Suga, unlike uh, pretty much every prime minister with a couple of exceptions from the DPJ over the last 20 years. He is not a hereditary politician. He did work his way up, um, you know, working from odd jobs, then working as a, a secretary to an LDP member, working in local politics. And you, know, you listen to him talk, he is not someone who speaks in abstractions uh, like Abe. He is not someone who talks about ideology. He is someone who wants to make, you know, it's very clear that his purpose of being in politics is to make life better for you know, ordinary people and wanting to listen to the people, wanting to be close to the people. And you know, if, if he follows that, that is the kind of approach to politics that I think could work. Uh, it could bring the public along and keep the public with him. He obviously faces uh, major challenges, uh, both internationally and then domestically with the pandemic and the economic fallout of the pandemic. So there's a lot of work to be done, but he, he certainly has things, many things working in his favor. So I'll stop there and uh, thank you again, Bryce. Right. Thanks uh, for a comprehensive uh, roundup. Again, the book is The Iconoclast, uh, Shinzo Abe and the New Japan. Um, what really impressed me about this book as well uh, as being a biography of um, Shinzo Abe, it really is a sort of snapshot of, um, of Japanese political history in the post-war. Um, but from the point of view um, from the point of view of a particular faction or group of leaders that, that hasn't really got a lot of attention um, in the past because it's only been in the last, well, couple of decades that they've, they've risen to the fore. And um, I do want to talk a little bit about um, what Abe believes, what, what I guess his, his factions believe. You said that Japan was exhausted with populism. And I think a lot of people, myself included, perhaps you too, um, might have thought that Abe was probably going to be given to um, some form of populism, um, in particular the conservative uh, nationalist uh, populism, the, the, the notion that uh, we have to clear the decks of the old powers that have tainted Japan and, and restore Japan, if not to a pre-war mentality, to a, uh, to a, we have to escape the post-war as it were. Um, but a lot of that a lot of that nationalism, there, there were hints of it, and even in, in his early current term, um, I mean, he did he did go to Yasukuni early in his term, Yasukuni, the, the, the war shrine in Tokyo. Um, he did also um, uh, make appointments, for example, the, the appointment to the NHK, uh, who was it, Momi, Momi Katsuto, um, a, a, a nationalist on the board of Japan's uh, national broadcaster, but over time, I think, you know, he mellowed a bit. And if you read the book, particularly around Yasukuni, I get the impression that, um, that, that you lay that a lot with his relationship with the United States, and particularly the, the Obama administration. It was Obama who was sort of telling him that, um, that these, these gestures uh, related to history were certainly not welcome. Was that the only factor, or were there other factors as well? Well, I, I mean, it's actually, it's, it, it's interesting with 
Yasukuni because also at the time Suga was telling him don't go there'll be plenty of opportunities later it's going to be a distraction your job is to focus on economics and and Suga lost that debate obviously and and, and I mean I, I don't think you can tell the story of that Yasukuni visit without you know the build-up um, you know the Obama administration when when Abe comes back uh, they were not happy to see him you know they you know they'd been committed to this rebalance to Asia you know wanted you know, Korea on side, you know, wanted things, you know, working out with Korea, were afraid that having a nationalist Japanese prime minister would push countries into you know, China's arms, that China would be able to be a propaganda victory for China by having this, this prime minister. And I think, um, you know, therefore, you know, over the course of 2013, you had a lot of um, exertion and, and leaning on Abe um, by, and, and not just by the Obama administration. I mean, you had, um, your former Republican Deputy Secretary of State, you know, Rich Armitage, going to uh, Japan in the fall of 2013 saying, like, really don't go, you know, like trying to impress on him the importance of, you know, th that it would not be good. Um, but what happened, I mean, what's interesting is what happened after that, right? He goes and pretty quickly afterwards, I mean, I, there's a real commitment you know, a, almost a, a recommitment on the part of the U.S. to we have to get relationship, you know, relations right with him. And, you know, we have to find a way forward. The Japan is just too important for what we want to achieve. And I think to Abe's credit, I think he reciprocated. And there was this process. I mean, and, and, and it's hard to get a sense of just how planned this all ended up being. But a, a, you know, a receptiveness in Tokyo to, we're going to talk about history. We're going to work on historical reconciliation. But we're going to try to avoid you know, any kind of finger pointing. No, you know, we're not gonna be demanding apologies. We're not gonna be um, assigning blame, but we will talk about it. And so, you know, and, and I think Australia figured in this as well. I mean, you get Abe going to Australia and giving, you know, a speech talking about history. It's not necessarily, you know, he's not apologizing, but he is sort of, you know, expressing remorse and, and you know, and then he does the same thing. He goes to Washington in 2015, gives a speech to the joint session of Congress, sort of the same tone. Um, then you get, uh, Obama coming to Hiroshima, and again, it's he doesn't, you know, Obama doesn't go to Hiroshima and apologize, but he does talk in the sort of lamenting, you know, a, a sourful tone about what happened, you know. And then Abe, at the very end, Abe goes to Pearl Harbor, and it's the same kind of discussion. So I think there was this attempt to, you know, let's let's we're not, we can't ignore talking about history, but we're gonna we're gonna try to find a way to talk about it that shows that we're, you know, that, that Abe cares, that he's not ignoring it. You know, you look at the 2015 statement on the 70th anniversary of the war, it's in the same kind of spirit. Um, you know, he, he, you know, in some ways for all the concern about it, it ended up being pretty anodyne. Um, you did get a 2015 agreement with the South Koreans on, you know, on the comfort women. Was it entirely satisfactory for the, for the Koreans? I mean, clearly not, you know, as you saw that once you get a new government, um, they walk away from it. Um, but I think for Abe, I mean, I think a lot of us were surprised in 2015 that, that you, were able, you were able even to get that kind of agreement uh, out, of, um, out of Abe, you know, with a, with a clear apology. Um, you know, the U.S., of course, put a lot of effort into making that agreement happen, you know, both in Seoul and in Tokyo. Um, so, I mean, I, you know, but what I, what I do think, um, and going back to just sort of Abe's you know, how he saw himself as a politician, you know, and, and what I found extremely interesting, and this comes out in the book, is that going back to very early in his career as a politician, where he was this sort of ideological firebrand and, you know, we're conservatives and we're strong and we're going to take down the post-war regime. Even then, you see him thinking about, well, what does it mean to actually govern? And, you know, and, I, and I point out to, you know, he cites Max Weber in, in this essay and he looks at back at, his, at the example of his grandfather and that it's not just, you know, we have an ideo ideological vision, we have, you know, then we're going to pursue it at all costs. It is trying to find a balance between governing, uh, you know, and wielding power and getting exactly what you want. And I think in 2006, 2007, he, he was not sort of mature enough to strike that balance. But I think by 2013 onwards, he, he learns, I think, how to temper some of those uh, expectations. And the other thing is, I think the world is so, you know, has, has changed, by 2012 has changed in important ways. You know, I think China, how China changed after uh, the global financial crisis, you know, much more assertive, you know, that, that what it, becoming a strong Japan, uh, it's not, you know, this is not ideological 
parlor games. You know, this becomes something that's much, you know, the stakes are much higher. You know, the, the, the risk to getting things wrong, um, to falling from power are that much greater. And, and I think um, that sort of helps temper kind of the more culture war aspects. And he does end up focusing on how do I make Japan as strong as possible? And, and that I think changes um, how he governs. And, and I think that commitment only grows as his tenure lengthens. Okay, I want to I want to stick with that for a while. I mean, you've you've gone you've you've given a great <clears throat> and lengthy answer. Um, I'm I'm just wondering about Suga though. So so one of the <clears throat> one of the qualities I guess that Abe had was that he he could kind of play to that base in a way uh, where he didn't actually have to give them. Uh, he could throw red meat to them, if you like. I mean, Abe could go and um, write little articles in Will and other right-wing magazines that played to uh, a sort of nationalist base in um, in in Japan without um, offering them any prime policy concessions. Uh, now we have Suga, who, um, at least in my assessment, largely from reading your book, um, comes comes across as somebody who's much more mild anyway and isn't given to uh, the sort of proclivities that um, that, that, that the, the, the young conservatives or the new conservatives, as you, as you label them in your book, um, uh, fret about. Um, uh, is he going to be able to control that uh, faction of the LDP or, or those elements within the LDP, do you think? I mean, it's, it's really, there are actually two questions there that, that actually have to be answered. So first, I mean, about Suga and controlling them. I mean, I, th I think you know, the fact that you know, instrumentally, you know, as leader of the LDP, he has control um, of the party in certain ways um, should help. I mean, and also you know, the, the threat of a snap election, um, the fact that I think the party's sort of senior leaders, you know, they made his election possible. Um, and, and so in general, I think discipline in the party is, the, the early signs are promising that he's gonna, that he will be able to discipline uh, his own party and ensure that backbenchers aren't, you know, aren't criticizing him uh, left and right and, and undermining his authority. It seems like he's gonna be in good shape on that front, specifically on the new conservative front. I mean, Suga is someone who, uh, I mean, I, in some ways, it makes me appreciate um, Abe in a lot of ways because you know we have decades of him writing things and saying things, and you know the new conservatives in some ways they're all about words, they're all about politics as words, and and you mentioned some of the publications, right? There's this whole ecosystem of journals and newspapers and you know lectures on YouTube. I mean, you want to know what they think? They're going to tell you. You know, they're not shy. They're you know like they're. Their ideas are out there, and you know a lot of a lot of in some ways a lot of what they did, and a lot you know Abe's political success was in some ways the the result of just like, I mean years of just agitating for for new ideas and and you know what, I guess what we might call pushing the Overton window in Japan right that you know changing the ideas that were acceptable for discussion I mean and you know we talk about the you know Abe's failure to get the constitution revised I mean the flip side of that is that when you compare it to when he was first um, elected to the Diet in the early 90s. I mean, the ability to talk about constitutional revision now, to talk about revising Article 9, I mean, you know, whatever taboos remained um, are gone. You know, 2017, Abe basically runs a general, you know, there's a general election campaign. It wasn't necessarily about the Constitution, but, you know, a few months before that, he had proposed his amendments, and I mean, there was no real penalty to doing that. And so, constitutional revision, I mean, that, I mean, they certainly shifted the, the discussion on that. Um, it's not necessarily guaranteed to happen anytime soon. But I think there are possibilities for that now, thanks to years of just you know, relentless talking about it. We don't necessarily have that kind of record of Suga talking about um, his vision for Japan, the ways in which Japan has to change. I mean, um, anyone who follows me on Twitter knows that I read through his, um, he wrote a book in 2012 before becoming chief cabinet secretary that, you know, all about controlling the bureaucracy. And it is dry. It is very dry. It is very focused on, and, and it just shows, I mean, it shows, I mean, and, and it speaks volumes in some ways because of that. I mean, it tells you that really Suga is not someone who is inclined towards these ideological flights of fancy. You know, he's not about building castles in the air. He's very much about what are concrete, concrete problems that the public is having, you know, and, and what can I do uh, as a politician to solve them? And, you know, that is um, what, you know, what, he is as a politician. What I will say though, and, and I do say this in the book, is that where I think, um, I, I think they overlap 
uh, where Abe and Suga share um, beliefs is that, I, I mean, I do think they both believe in the importance of a strong state. And, you know, in the book, I say that this is really Abe's core belief more than anything else, that, you know, to survive in a, in a uh, turbulent world in a century where Japan faces a, a number of challenges at home, Japan needs a strong state above all else, and a, you know, a state that is able to wield power and meet those challenges. And I think Suga is absolutely committed to that. Um, you know, I, I, I mean, and in some ways m might even be more committed because I, I don't know if he's going to really want to spend his time or political capital on the constitution, for example, which, um, you know, Japan can have a strong state without constitution revision. You know, there's a lot they can do, um, you know, to govern effectively without changing a word of the constitution. And we saw this during the Abe years when, you know, you've got reinterpretation um, without, without amending. Um, so, so, I mean, Suga, I think, will, will continue that. It is a question, I mean, you do have, um, you know, this, you know, these new conservatives, mainly in Abe's uh, whole enough faction, but, you know, kind of scattered throughout the party. Um, and it is a question, you know, they, they did vote for Suga. Uh, they were not able to put up a candidate of their own. I mean, there was some, you know, discussion of, you know, a, a sort of a new conservative candidate who would run, um, you know, some of Abe's followers. But it is, I mean, it is in interesting to look at who the future leaders of the party are. And the fact is that Abe, uh, you know, Abe was the horse they were riding and, and they, they threw a lot of you know, their weight behind him. But the bench among sort of this new conservative block within the LDP is actually pretty thin. There's not an obvious um, next leader you know, who's, who, who's, who's had the top jobs, you know, is, a, is considered a heavyweight, uh, is on the short list of potential successors for Suga now. Um, you know, the, the people on that list are, are generally not um, not these kind of ideological firebrands. And so it is a question, like if you have this block that um, doesn't necessarily have someone of their own to put up, you know, how does a leader kind of keep them on side? Um, what sort of you know, bones is, is Suga going to have to throw, for example, when he throws, when he forms a cabinet, you know, does he, you know, does he have to um, include certain numbers of their ranks? Um, and, and I mean, I guess maybe then there's a question of, you know, do we have, you know, is there going to be a shift to maybe what we might call Abeism, where um, not necessarily the, the young Abe, you know, who was this ideological firebrand, you know, that, who hadn't quite been tempered by pragmatic, strong statism, you know, is there now going to be sort of a block of people committed to this idea of a strong state, you know, prioritizing efforts to, to wield power effectively, both economically and in foreign policy, and, and you know, veterans of his government now sort of being committed to that, and that being the way forward. Um, that, that I mean, I, I'm kind of thinking, you know, as we go, because we don't know yet. But but I do wonder if that that is going to be the future of the LDP for the years to for at least the next few years to come. Great. Okay. So um, for those of you who are writing in uh, your uh, questions, thank you very much. Uh, do keep them coming. Um, I've just turned on the upvote function, so if you see a question you like, click on it, and uh, it'll rise to the top. Um, I do want to ask a question that Zara Kempton, who is our uh, national vice president, hi Zara, um, has asked, how are things down in Melbourne? Um, uh, she, she wants to talk broadly about the role of women in Japanese society and also in politics. I mean, this was a big uh, platform of Abe's economic policy, at least a uh, rhetorical platform of Abe's third arrow. Um, was the, the notion of bringing women into the workforce. Uh, we might look at that and say that um, he's had some mixed results there, but one area where there has been no movement at all, really, um, if indeed he did um, focus on it, was in the political world. I mean, there have been very few uh, women in Abe's cabinets, and we see that in the... Um, in the leadership race, in the end, there were there were three guys. I don't think uh, Norisenko was ever a um, a, uh, a a contender. So, um, so can you comment briefly on that? I mean, how have how have women or the position of women in Japanese society fared under Abe, given that he uh, did actually stress uh, the role of women in the economy? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a great question, and and you heard, I mean, you heard the importance of it. Um, in a lot of ways, by you know, if you look at and it was a short campaign, um, but in the debates um, that the candidates had, it was actually it was a subject that actually came up uh, a lot and repeatedly. Um, 
I mean, the record, I mean, it, it's definitely a mixed record. And, and that, I mean, I think on most issues, when you look at Ave's record, it's a mixed record that um, some things changed. Things probably did not change as much as people had wanted or, or desired. Um, on the, the positive side, I mean, you've seen um, a pretty marked, marked increase in uh, female employment, you know, and, and women's participation in the work for, workplace has now surpassed the United States, some other democracies. I mean, Japan, uh, you know, it, it has now changed. And I think what you've had also is, is the so-called M curve, you know, this idea that women might enter the workforce um, after leaving school, but then leave to have to start families and then come back in. And so, you know, women's particip participation goes like that. Um, my understanding is that, that really has been flattened, that um, you don't, you have not seen quite as much dropping out of the workforce and coming back. So on the plus side, I mean, you know, that, that you know, the, the, the infrastructure to enable women to stay in the workforce has improved. I mean, I think, you know, the, you know, they never were able to completely eliminate, for example, um, the wait, you know, the waiting list for, for daycare slots, you know, it's con you know, in, in some ways it seemed that the more slots they opened, the more demand there was for it. So that's, you know, I think going to be a constant challenge. Um, you know, the last several years you had this focus on working styles reform and, you know, which was not just about women's opportunities, that was also about encouraging men to go home and, and be involved in family life more, which, I mean, and, and I think, um, I mean, I'm, I'm a working father and, and, you know, my wife works and, you know, that I, I'm well aware that, you know, the only way that women can really be active in the workforce is if you do have, um, you know, if they have partners who are as committed, you know, to family life and to taking care of the house and to taking care of children as, there um, as as women are, and I mean that still, Japan I think still has a long way to go on that. I mean, what is interesting is that I think you've seen more progress, probably on working style, um, in the last six months as a result of um, the embrace of teleworking after years of of not, not really any progress on that front in Japan. Um, and we'll have to see you know as as the pandemic recedes, kind of what's left and, and what change is possible in that environment. Um, but there's still a long way to go, I think, at that level. Um, pol politics, as you said, um, not, yeah, I mean, you have not, I mean, the only way you're going to see women in leadership positions in politics is if they're able to run for office in the first place and then work their way up and, and have the, the job. And you just haven't seen that. I mean, um, you know, you had some women who Abe tried to kind of move along and, and one of those new conservatives, Inada, you know, someone Abe brought into politics back in 2005 and basically tried to groom her as a successor with, with no real success at that. Um, you, you, there just, there aren't, there's still, there's, you need more women entering politics. And, and you know, the problem is now that with the LDP having such stable majorities, um, you know, we're, you've, it's going to be hard to find those slots. You know, the, there's not a lot of low hanging fruit in terms of marginal seats that the LDP can hope to pick up, um, you know, and, and have, you know, those candidates be female. And so that's going to be, a, you know, a continuing challenge going forward. One area in which I think you have seen change in the national government is on the bureaucratic side. You know, that when you look at um, women taking the entrance exam for the elite bureaucratic positions have actually been at record highs. And as results of the intake, at, in, in the elite bureaucracy has also consistently now been at record highs. Um, I mentioned earlier um, their, 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 their ability to um, control personnel decisions at the highest level of the bureaucracy. In many cases, um, and Suga was you know, responsible for these decisions, they used that power to put women into director general positions, section chief positions, um, administrative vice minister position. So uh, consistently now putting women into the highest positions in the bureaucracy in ways that they hadn't before. Which, so, I mean, I think the Japanese over time, because you've had women entering in larger numbers into the bureaucracy, that's going to change the complexion of, um, you know, just of, you know, what the Japanese government looks like, who's actually in the key jobs. Um, hopefully over time too, you know, those women in the bureaucracy will also leave to enter politics. And so you will get more female candidates. It'll, it'll give them a leg up, but there's, there's still a lot of work to do. You know, th this idea that, you know, for example, early on, you know, when one women, when one was unveiled, you know, that Japan was going to have 30% uh, female executives by 2020. I mean, it was, it was a far, it was a stretch when it was announced. And, and I think over time it was, uh, realized that it was not a not a, a goal that the government could achieve and was not really devoting enough attention to trying to achieve and so there's there's a long way to go and and it's going to remain an issue and i think it's encouraging though that the ldp felt the need to talk about it as much uh during the campaign so we'll see what, what comes next with that 
Right. Um, I want to turn to foreign policy now, and I'm probably going to go in all sorts of directions here. But um, <laughs> Troy, Troy Crystal asks, uh, in talking about Suga as not believing in castles in the sky and being more concrete, do you see Suga as being a much more inward-focused PM? Um, and is he less likely to step up into leading on world affairs as Abe was? Uh, my question that I'm going to insert in there um, is... Um, is, I mean, we've seen Abe come out um, just before he stepped down and talk about um, uh, defense priorities for Japan, in particular, you know, the, 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 the missile threat and whatnot and how to, how to deal with that. And Abe has said that he's going to be kind of uh, supporting the, the government from the back benches and, and giving advice on foreign policy. Um, is that going to be relevant or is it going to be a, a major part of, of I mean is Abe going to be a major part of the LDP's foreign policy going forward and one more question if I can um, there are a few questions here about um, about Australia Japan relations what's your take on Australia Japan relations going forward I'm sure you're capable of uh, telling yeah, us sure. what to think yeah um, so I mean this this is you know, if Suga you know, on his short among his shortcomings, I mean, I, you know, he has not been foreign minister. He has not, you know, has not had the sort of face-to-face -face, um, interactions, relationships with foreign leaders that Abe had. You know, and um, in the near term too, um, kind of the the positive and negative of, of the pandemic is that you know he's not going to necessarily be making the, these foreign trips in the way that Abe had. You know, there's not going to be he's not going to have the same opportunities, but also the same requirements to, to be in the room with, with foreign leaders. And so that maybe will give them a little breathing room at first. But, you know, as, as things get back to some sort of normal, I mean, he's going to have to really show that he's capable of, um, you know, of, of having the kind of relationships and, and really delivering results um, in the bilateral relationships and multilateral settings. Uh, you know, and, and I think, you know, Abe, not that Abe's English, I think, was great. But I mean, I don't, I don't believe that Suga really has much at all. And that, that could be a factor as well, you know, that when he goes overseas, when he meets with leaders, um, if you have a second uh, Trump term, um, it might affect the kind of relationship he had, you know, he has with, um, you know, with the US president. I mean, which obviously is, is job number one in some ways, as far as foreign policy is concerned. You know, the, the expectation for, it, for any Japanese prime minister is you have to get the relationship with the US president right and with the US right. And so he's gonna, you know, that, that is going to be something he's gonna have to um, try to, to measure up to. I mean, I think, as you say, I mean, I think Abe uh, is, is gonna be involved in this. I mean, it, it's very easy to see Abe serving as a personal envoy uh, at times, um, offering his advice, offering insight into uh, Suga's foreign counterparts. Um, it's easy to see that continuing into a role that his grandfather played. You know, his grandfather left the premiership in 1960, was in the diet for 20-something uh, years after that, and you know, was was heavily involved in um, foreign relations, you know, helped his, his brother, uh, Sato, um, conclude the treaty with South Korea in 1965. I mean, it's very easy to see ways in which um, Abe will be able to chip in um, on diplomacy with various countries in the region. And so, um, you know, in that sense, I mean, Suga um, will be fortunate. I mean, and I think, it, you know, he will have to see who he picks to be his foreign minister. I mean, that, you know, I, I think um, may, there may be more for his foreign minister to do than um, Abe's foreign minister sometimes had to do because Abe was conducting so much foreign policy of his own um, from the prime minister's office. Um, so, then on, on to the defense question, um, you know, Abe um, left his successor with, I think, a pretty tough question to answer. I mean, this, this idea of whether Japan needs its own independent deterrent. And Abe obviously didn't go so far as to actually bind Suga one way or another. Uh, but it's one of the biggest questions that um, Suga faces in the coming months. And, and I mean, personally, I, I've, I find it hard to believe that Suga is going to want to spend a lot of political capital early on on an issue that... Um, is pretty controversial within his coalition with, with Komito, who we haven't really talked about. Um, I, I don't think there's the public is crying out for Japan to have its own ability to strike other countries. I mean, it, it, it definitely opens a lot of um, questions that, that um, I, I think a, a new prime minister trying to find his footing is not going to want to take. So probably I, I would guess that he's going to punt on it, but I mean, we'll have to see. Japan, Australia, um, you know, Abe is clearly one of the relationships Abe's invested a lot in, um, both on a bilateral basis and then also, you know, part of the Quad and, and um, you know, making uh, Japan and Australia as part of a 
wider coalition of democracies. Obviously, you can't talk about Japan, Australia without looking at China and, and what Japan decides to do about China. Uh, and that maybe is maybe the, the most important question. And I think you'll see you know, continued investment in defense cooperation and uh, deepening the TPP or TP, TPP is going to be a priority and that's going to be an area Japan and Australia can work together on. Um, but I don't think we really have a strong sense of what Suga wants to do uh, on China. I, I mean, I think the winds in Tokyo, I think, have shifted. Um, I mean, it's, it's, remarkable, it's remarkable to think that as this year started, it looked like this was going to be the year that Xi Jinping goes to Japan, um, you know, cementing uh, this idea of a constructive relationship and, you know, with a strong uh, foundation of bilateral economic cooperation. Uh, and clearly between Hong Kong, China's activities in the South and East China Seas, um, Kind of lots of noise about Taiwan, tech competition, uh, supply chains, all of this suggests that, that it's very hard for anyone making the case for a constructive relationship uh, with China to be heard in Japan. And so that, I think, um, is going to push a Suga government uh, more towards cooperation with Australia, India, the United States, and so on. Um, the one factor, maybe countervailing factor, is that Suga's election depended on um, uh, Toshihiro Nikai, you know, he was the one who sort of you know, threw his weight behind Suga early on, helped bring the factions on board, and looks likely to continue to wield influence in the LDP. And he is, of course, the LDP's leading China hand, uh, was instrumental in Abe's approach to China during the last few years. And so to the extent that there's any pushback against this kind of um, China bashing um, it's going to come from there, and, and that might be a kind of break on it. But we'll have to see. And actually, Komaito also, I think, could be a break on it as well. So um, we'll have to see. That'll that'll set the tone in a lot of ways. But but it is a big question. Great. Um, so we've discussed. You've just you've just uh, mentioned Komaito, and um, I don't want to go there. But we've discussed Komaito. We've discussed uh, the LDP. Um, I want to talk briefly about um, about opposition politics in Japan. Um, you know, 2009 was a big year. It sort of marked the kind of maturation, if you like, of the Japanese two-party system. But um, since then, it hasn't been particularly rosy for the opposition. Now, you, of course, cut your teeth. I, I forgot to mention in the uh, in the introduction, you were you worked for an opposition pol politician um, uh, years and years ago. Um, and I mean, you probably do have some insight into opposition politics, well, you have a lot of insight into opposition politics in Japan. Um, it seems that what is and was the uh, Constitutional Democratic Party of Japan is trying to forge a new political force. Is there any sense that they might be successful? Um, what's the fate of opposition politics in Japan? <laughs> um, like yeah, I mean, I'm, uh, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm clearly, you yeah, know, the, the the fate of the opposition is something that, I mean, I, I mean, I care about because I think, um, you know, and, and to some extent, I mean, Abe is a, a testament to uh, the value of, you know, competition between two parties and alternation of power. I mean, if the LDP um, hadn't lost in 2009, um, you know, the LDP, you know, had its time in opposition and had to really think about, you know, ways in which it needed to change. Abe, you know, you know, at the same time, Abe was thinking about ways he had to change. And the party, you know, embraced you know, the new approach to economic policy that had been on, you know, on the margins for a long time, um, you know, recognized that it had to do some things different to retake power. And, and, and that's a valuable experience. And, and um, you know, really, I mean, the fact, you know, just by making the LDP a more disciplined party, I think was, was valuable um, in some sense. And, um, you know, I think, again, we're seeing the LDP could use more competition, but I, I don't think they're going to get it anytime soon. I, I mean, you, I don't think the public expects much from um, what looks like, I mean, you know, and, and in, in you know, 2017, um, the Constitutional Democrats, you know, form as a splinter from, you know, the old Democratic Party, um, which had really struggled after going back into opposition in 2012. Um, and, and, you know, Ed Anno, the, the head of the Constitutional Democrats, I think he wanted to make a new brand, um, you know, wanted to sort of distance himself from uh, memories of the Democratic Party, uh, bring new people into politics, starting, you know, at a local level and recruiting candidates for, for local elections, um, really trying to change the image and rebuild uh, a, the trust, regain the trust of voters, which is, you know, was instr instrumental to the Democrats taking power in the first place, that, you know, they had overcome uh, you know, I think whatever, you know, reluctance voters had to support them, you know, and view them as a credible governing party, I think voters got over that, accepted it, and then in 2007, they win the upper house, in 2009, they win power. The Constitutional Democrats are not there. <laughs> They're just not, and, and I don't think this merger um, 
is going to really do it either. I mean, I, in, in too many ways, it looks like they're just putting the old Democratic Party back together. It's a lot of the same names, um, you know, which means it's going to be the same personality clashes, a lot of the same um, and the difference of opinion. I mean, they've shed some people, um, Maya Hara most notably, who was, I think, a source of um, ideological strife within the party. Um, and, and so maybe there are some gains from it. But I don't think the public is anywhere near at a point where it's going to trust them with power. And, and so it could be years. I mean, I mean, given that there's, I think, so much um, priority on stability and continuity right now, and you, know, you look at how the pub, how public opinion has shifted on Abe since he announced his resignation, you know, his, his, he's going to leave office, you know, with 60% <laughs> approval ratings again, after falling to the low 30s, because I think people are um, happy to have a change of leader, but not necessarily looking for a change of government. And so Suga is, you know, going to step into that. And I think, you know, the ease with which um, people have now shifted their support to Suga, and, you know, his support has, has risen, um, you know, that, that um, both within the LDP and, and, and outside the LDP, that people were comfortable with him. That's going to be really hard for the opposition to make headways against. Um, you know, his, and, and Suga's, you know, his, his pragmatism, his flexibility, um, you know, that was one of the things, the, you know, the opposition struggled with during the op the Abe years. Abe, um, on economic policy, was willing to take ideas from the opposition side repeatedly. I think he limited the amount of space they had for policy competition. Um, and so, um, and, and even, you know, we saw even when, you know, you had influence peddling scandals, you know, you, you know which should have been gifts for the opposition. They were completely unable uh, to use those to make headway. So I, I don't, you know, I, I think the, you know, the weakness of the opposition is going to continue to work uh, in the government's favor and, and going to help Suga, I think, find his footing because he, I don't think he has much to fear for them from, from the opposition right now. Okay, so that's uh, all we have time for uh, today. Um, the book, again, is The Iconoclast. Uh, it's available in specialty bookstores in, online in Australia. Um, that's where I got this one. I, I'm not sure if it's available in main, main bookstores yet, but it's a great read. I'd thoroughly recommend it. Um, as I said, it, it really um, sums up not only the man, but the period uh, he existed in and the forces he ran amongst. So um, please uh, do go out and get it. And if you can't get it, uh, sign up to Tobias's Twitter feed where he will regale you with his threads on Suga's biography. <laughs> um, so there's little, little, little more for me to say, but thank you, Tobias, for being here. It's been great to, to, to chat after so long. Yeah, thank you, Bryce. Really appreciate it. And hopefully uh, one day you can come down here and, and sell your next book. Yes, <laughs> I would love to. Hopefully that world returns. Okay. Uh, don't go away. We, uh, of course, have um, what's coming up next uh, to show you. Um, but thank you all for joining us uh, today for what was a very fascinating talk. And I'll leave you with the outro.